Hello again and welcome to Hardcore Truth, uh, where we are attempting to bring the light of truth into the darkness of compromise and apostasy. We continue on today now in our series of messages from the book of Judges called Commission to Lead, remembering that the theme of our whole series is that if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, 1 Corinthians 11.31. This is from the 10th chapter of the book of Judges, and it's a study of two judges that you probably never heard of, Tola and Jair. And the message is entitled, Are You a Leader or a Manager? Let's pray as we begin. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word once again today. I pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing upon my life as I bring your word, Lord, that not only would it cut to the marrow of my life, but that it would cut to the marrow of those who listen, Lord God, and that we would all examine ourselves, that we would all judge ourselves so that you don't have to judge us in these last days. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Clearly, God is judging in these last days as we are winding down to the second coming of Christ, and he's preparing his church, his remnant of the church to be perfected in these last days. Now, a couple of messages ago, we looked at the Judge Deborah, and we saw that uh, in this church age that we're living in, many men, in particular men, have been emasculated. Well, I guess it would have to be men emasculated and become feminized. It's rampant. And in fact, these young men today, they don't even know how feminized they've become if only they could have grew up in the 40s or the 50s and maybe be transported to today, they would see, wow, we, we've really become wimpy and sissy boys. And so we saw that there's a problem when there's rapid church growth, uh, with the, when the core group of the church has not been made solid disciples, immersed in God and learning to observe, what happens is that the, 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 if there's a great move of God and many people come into the church, all these people come into the church with their worldly concepts. And if, if the people in the church haven't been made disciples, well, then they're not going to make these other people disciples, but they're going to make them what they are, and that's attendees. Big difference. The problem is that so much of the world has come into the church. And so we uh, have to see that if we have not taught the new people in the, that come into the church to judge themselves, to disown themselves, if I may, take up their cross and follow Christ, then, then they're going to live the way we've been living, if that's the way we've been living. And that's the way most people in the church have been living. They have not disowned themselves, taken up their cross and followed Christ. They are not judging themselves and therefore they're being judged. And so we, what we have is a despising of the Word of God. And what we, what we have, if people are not made disciples, then they end up j letting their circumstances in life judge the Word of God rather than the Word of God judging their circumstances in life. And then we get this false salvations where people at best have been inoculated from ever getting the real. This game, this hyper-grace game, this licentiousness game that allows sin in people's lives, excuses sin in people's lives, is actually aborting the, the, their, their life with God. It's a spiritual abortion, and it's got to stop, and it's got to stop with you, and it's got to stop with me. We have people who've been in the church for years, and yet they don't have a prayer life. They don't have a vision of, for, the, for their ministry and the Great Commission, which is their destiny in life. Hey, God help us. My belief is that the individual believers are not judging themselves. And now God is judging us and bringing a remnant to maturity. I think that's what the latter rain is all about. The former rain uh, germinates the crop. The latter rain produces it for the harvest. And boy, are we there. God help us to be a part of that small remnant. Christians, especially men, should be 
warriors with a lion roaring in their hearts, filled with the zeal of God, who are fighting the enemies and of, of their lives and of their homes and of their marriages and of their families. I'm either directly or indirectly right now at this very moment as I speak to you involved indirectly or, or directly in eight marriages that are so-called Christians that are absolutely melting down one getting a divorce. Uh, God have mercy. We're not judging ourselves. We, we need to and men need to rise up and fight for their wives, fight for their homes, fight for their families and their own lives. Nehemiah 4.14, it says, Don't be afraid of them being the enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, the devil. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I just love that verse. And we must always remember that we're the dwelling place of God. We are the very temple of the Holy Spirit. And we can't allow compromise and defilement in this temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know you not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Ah, you should not... Go and study that temple in the Old Testament and how holy it was and how no one was allowed to, to desecrate it in any way. And now this is the temple. You see, when we truly believe that, we are the temple, then we're going to live like we are and we will separate the profane from the holy. We will judge ourselves and we will cleanse the temple of God. The Lord is at work today separating the sheep from the goats. He's calling a remnant who are, who are judging themselves and are coming out. The, after all, the word church means, actually ecclesia means I call out. And so the Bible even refers to Israel as they were in the wilderness, as the church in the wilderness. Why? Because they were the called out of Egypt. And we are the called out of Babylon, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the church. God isn't passive about his church. He's zealous and he's looking uh, for us to be leaders in, in judging ourselves and leading other people to judge themselves in his zeal with judgment to anyone who threatens his holy tab habitation. Remember in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, he flipped over the tables. He says the zeal of God consumed him. It burned in his soul and he made a whip of cords and he cast out the money changers and overthrew the tables because they were defiling his temple. And that's what he's doing in our lives. If we won't do it ourselves, zeal of God. For his holy habitation burned, burned in Jesus' soul was a flame of fire that cannot, will not be quenched. Jesus said, if we follow him, he would cause us to be fishers of men. He didn't say, if you follow me, I will cause you to be attendees at meetings. Matthew 4, 4 19 is that verse. Jesus said, I'm going to follow me and I will make you. That means I will cause you to become fishers of men. This means that if we are disciples, if we're abiding in him, he will cause us to have the same passion and fire in our belly for his temple as he has. And I believe that it also means that if a person isn't spontaneously, really important word, not forced, not done out of guilt, not because you feel I have to do this, but spontaneously fishing for others to become disciples. He's not truly following Christ the way he should or she should. It's that simple. Truly following Christ gives us a zeal to be and to cause others to be followers of him and temple cleansers in the zeal of God. We've got to judge ourselves today and we've got to teach others by that example to do the same. We must judge what we see, what we hear, what we do, what we say. In this time of the book of Judges is a 450-year period. God raised up judges, and it is my contention that he's still doing that, not in the same way, 
but he's raising up judges that will judge themselves and cause others to do the same. 1 Corinthians 11.31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, now we're going to move on in the book of Judges, and we're going to study two uh, bozos. Uh, one's name is Tola, the other one is Jair. Uh, they're known as minor judges. There's a, a, a few other minor judges that we see in Judges 12, 8 through 15. Their names are uh, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. But we're going to look at Tola and Jair, because what we say about Tola and Jair applies to those guys as well. Not much is written about them. 45 years of their reign, these two bozos. Not much is written in the commentaries. Yet I think there's something that we must learn from them. Must learn from them. Judges 10, 1 through 5. And after Abimelech, remember we studied Abimelech last time. After Abimelech there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pooh, I suppose that's where they got Winnie the Pooh from, Tola, the son of Pooh, the son of Dodo, <laughs> a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shimar in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shimar. And after him rose Jair, a Gileadite, a judge in Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty judged thirty cities. Uh, called have a Jr unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead, and Jr died and was buried in Gilead. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all that's written about them. All the other judges have got great stories written about their lives, of their struggles and their accomplishment. These don't men. These men don't have a testimony, and we need to have a testimony. And it's more about what uh, people, when asked about their testimony, they, they want to talk about what happened to them 30, 40 years ago when they got saved. You better have one now. What's God doing in your life now? What's God doing through your life now? What's God saying to you as you study his word every day now? That's our testimony, and we need to have one. Tola and Jr. didn't. This should be the focus of our Sunday fellowship. We should not gather to be spectators at an event, but rather we should gather to share Christ with one another. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 touches on this. So does the book of Leviticus, but uh, 14, 26 of 1 Corinthians. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you has a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done in decency and in order. That's not an exhaustive list. It's making a point. The point that's made in the book of Leviticus is that the people were to bring the flour, the wine, the frankincense. People are to bring to God's gathering. It's not just a, a time where we sing a bunch of songs and then listen to a shallow message or a good message. It, it, the, the, the good message should be there. Singing a few songs should be there. But the testimony should be the focal point. What's God doing in your life? We should come to church, to fellowship, to bring something, not just to get something. God help us to see this. If there's not a fresh testimony in our lives, that means that we're falling away. We've fallen from the zeal of God. We've fallen from friendship, oneness, and fellowship with God. If there's not a fresh testimony, a fresh revelation, just a sure, sure sign that we're not diligently seeking the face of the Lord and that we're not overcoming. Instead, we're being overcome. Revelation 12.11 has something to say about that. It says, And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So, is your life centered on being entertained in church, in meetings? Or is it about being the church that goes and centered on overcoming in Christ? Somebody said to me quite a while ago, in fact, the man just died recently that said this to me, fine man of God. This guy, this man couldn't talk about Jesus without welling up tears in his eyes every time I ever talked to him. 
He pulled up alongside of me one day as I was walking down the street, and he said, Hey, Bob, here's a question for you. What if you loved God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole strength, and your whole mind? What would your life look like? Got to run. He drove off. <laughs> I thought about that. What if we love God with our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind? What would we look like to God? And what would we look like to others? What a question. Of course, we'd look good to God, but what, to others, we'd look like fools today. And that's why most people don't love God with their whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, because they're concerned about what other people will think about them. This is one of the biggest sources of, of, of uh, compromise in the church that there is. But what should be, we be more concerned about? Being liked by people or God's approval? When we were born again, we are given a permit to open carry the Spirit of God. Matthew 5, 14 and 16, you're the light of the world. Uh, a city cannot be set on a hill. Uh, excuse me, a, a city is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and that it give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If they're glorifying you, they're probably not the good works of God coming through you. But if they're glorifying God, they're saying, well, that guy can't do it. I know that guy. That guy's really changed. Something's happened in his life. I know that woman. That's not the way she used to be. Something's really changed. And they, they realize that we can't do that in our own strength, and they glorify God. But instead of open carrying, most people conceal carry out of the fear of what would they, they would look like to other people. This is called privatizing. We, we've been taught today to privatize politics and religion, and that's a coward's lie. Every political decision is a moral decision. And we were taught not to talk, don't talk about politics or religion. Why, that's all we should be talking about. Because they can't be separated. There's, oh, but what about the separation of church and state? Well, that's a lie. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that there's a separation of church and state. It's a, it's a, what it says is that the, the state is separated from the church and can't make any laws over the church. It doesn't say that the church can't influence the state. I'm learning that when we open carry Christ, we become leaders and, and I feel it's important for all of us to be as good a leader as we possibly can be. Therefore, we've got to be zealous in being disciples and making disciples. We've got to be zealous in being immersed in God and immersing other people in God. And we've got to be zealous about learning to observe and own and carry the Word of God in our hearts. To judge our thoughts and our acts. One of the... Th Things we see about Toll and Jay are they didn't accomplish anything. And after their death, the people just flocked to idolatry, which must have been going on covertly in their hearts all the while. Look at all the youth that have been raised in Christian homes today. Christian homes. God help us to see. They fall away when they go to college. 80% of kids who were raised in the church stop attending. There you go with that word. Stop attending when they're in the college. If someone is raised to be a disciple of Christ, they don't stop being a disciple of Christ. But if they've been raised to be an attendee at church, when they get in college and get out of the house, they quit being attendees at the church. Why? Well, let's find out from Tola and J.R. The reason that there's no testimony for Tol and Jera, I believe, is that these men weren't leaders at all. They were just managers, caretaking the status quo. And this is what we see in, in the world, in, in, the, in the Christian marriage, in the, in the Christian family, in the Christian church today. Managers, not leaders. There was an admiral in the Navy. Her name was Grace Hooper. A woman, admiral, 
She's called the mother, mother of the modern day Navy because she was an electrical engineer and she is the one who spearheaded and moved the Navy into the computer age. I listened to Admiral Hooper's retirement speech. And one of the things that she said in that speech is that our universities are spewing out managers. Machines need managers. People need leaders. What a statement. And it's obvious that today there are very few leaders. And don't, don't, don't think I'm just talking about pastors, although I am. But I'm talking about fathers and mothers. Very few leaders who are truly following Jesus. But we've got a lot of managers. <laughs> Which one are you? Which one am I? It's not enough to sit in a pew, live a good life, attend the church, raise up nice goody-two-shoe kids. The Mormons do that. It's not enough to attend the youth group, the campus group, or recovery group and, 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 and be intimidated to, to live a holy life and to speak out about the truth of God's word. It's not enough to do that. We've got to be bold and courageous followers of Jesus and lead others to do the same. We've got to judge ourselves and lead others to do the same. We must decide which we will strive to be, bold, courageous, zealous leader or a fearful manager. Which one am I? Which one are you? The first step in being a leader is to accept personal responsibility for our condition. We must see ourselves as no excuse victors, not excuse making victims. As long as we blame other people and make excuses for our situation, we actually prevent ourselves from repentance and change. So let's define our terms. A leader, someone who's out in front, full of courage, letting that light shine, facing fear, living Christ no matter the cost. Someone with grace given, Holy Spirit given, backbone, who will stand up and speak up for truth again no matter the cost. Someone who sets an example by judging himself. Someone who by his life is saying, follow me as I follow Christ, I'll show you the way. They're self-sacrificing, disciplined, responsible, committed to the cause. They never ask someone to do what they're not willing to do, or at least have done and maybe aren't able anymore because of age. They never make excuses, always take personal responsibility for their behavior. They have integrity. They have diligence and honor. These things are at their core. They're committed to the cause. What cause? The mission of being light-bearing soldier priests and making disciples of Christ. Again, not just church attendees. Luke 14, 33, Whosoever he that be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Cannot be. Leaders are, are totally committed to living a life of excellence and coming out of everything that is or even looks like compromise. Of course, Jesus Christ is the best example of a leader. He was out front. He shined. He set the example. He was self-sacrificing. He lived a life of excellence. He was disciplined, responsible. He stood up and spoke out for truth. He was committed. He asked people to follow him, and he told them what the result of following them would be. What would it be? Death to self and persecution. And becoming fishers of men. <laughs> Paul also was a leader. He was out front. He set the example of excellence. He was self-sacrificing and committed. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 29. Of the Jews, can't just read over this. <laughs> of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes. I want you to imagine that. Once would be enough. Oh, then twice and thrice and four and five times. The man looked, must have been the ugliest thing in the world with scars all over his face and back. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
once stoned, three times a shipwreck, a night and the day bobbing around in the deep, in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside these things that are without that which is cometh upon me daily, the care of the church. Some people... I was told by someone in the know at a mission sending organization that sometimes people come in and they, they want to go to a certain place in the world and they're asking questions about it. And one of the questions that one of them, usually the wife, but now the man too, is it safe there? If that question's asked, this particular missions organization is done with them right now. Goodbye. You're looking for safety. You're in the wrong place. If you're looking for safety, you're looking. The, you're in the wrong place. If you're a Christian, you have come to the wrong place. It's said that the safest place on earth is in the center of the will of God. Not true. The safe, that's the most dangerous place on earth. Is in the center of God's will. You can't live godly and not be persecuted. It's also said, if you've got nothing worth dying for, you've got nothing worth living for. And boy, is that the case of most people today. They have nothing worth living for because they have nothing worth dying for. And this is the key to being a leader. Do you have a faith worth dying to yourself? to your dreams, to your ways, to your comfort, to your time, to your money, to your addictions and idols? Do I? Do you? Jesus and Paul had a belief system worth dying for, and then it was worth living for. And they lived lives of excellence. Like Christ, Paul was committed. He called people to follow him and his life example. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Follow me as I follow the Lord. That's a leader. That's our definition of a leader. So what's a manager? Something altogether different. They carry their faith privately. And all they do is to keep things running and maintain the status quo. They only do what is expected of them. They only act uh, in, in a reactive way instead of a proactive way. They only do what, what, what people expect them to do and no more. They never rock the boat. They give way to their fears. Sissy boys. They, they don't set an example of letting the word judge them. Many times they've not done what they're asking other people to do. Even their own children, they haven't done what they're asking them to do. Their life is a total mess with little discipline, little self-sacrifice, no commitment to excellence, only slothful confusion and chaos. They always make excuses. They see themselves as victims and they live in bitterness and blame others for their personal failures, weaknesses, and sins. They are just maintaining, as I said, the status quo. They have no passion for anything and live in an irresponsible, chaotic life situation. Their cars are filthy. Their homes are filthy. They can't find their car keys. They don't know where their glasses are. They're, everything is in disorder and disarray and confusion. They're church pew potatoes watching other people live, trying to live off of someone else's walk with God. They're running so fast uh, to have things of the world that when it comes to spiritual things, they're zombies. Men and women both need to get their priorities right and in the zeal of God fight the temptations of the world. Our homes, our churches, and society need spiritually strong men and strong women to be leaders that means we must get off the bench, the pew, or the couch and get in the battle. God's people don't need managers. As Admiral Hooper said, machines need managers. God's people need leaders. Which one are you? 
Ayatollah and Jayar, just managers. And what was the result? Notice their leadership started in the home. Judges 10.4. And he had, uh, Jer had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts. And they, uh, they, they had 30 cities in which were called Jayar unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. Jayar had 30 sons who rode on 30 ass colts who were judges. In those days, an ass colt was the equivalent of an expensive sports car, pickup truck, or SUV. Kings rode on them when they came in peace. Christ rode on one when he came in his own parade. So what we see here is that he had 30 spoiled brat kids that amounted nothing to nothing but a bunch of asses. One result of being a committed leader is disciplined children both physical and spiritual, who follow you as they follow Christ. You want to know how someone's walk with God is? Look at how they treat their wife and how they treat their children. Look at how, how the wife treats the husband and the children. That, that's where our walk with God needs to be judged is in our home. This hypocritical game played on Sunday morning. To have disciplined children, we've got to be disciplined. To cause people to be disciples of Christ, we've got to be disciples of Christ. There are way too many manager husbands and parents and manager leaders in the church who tell others, tell others to do what they don't do and never set the example. Well, most of them don't even tell other people to do these things anymore because they don't do them themselves. There's many so-called saints who are sitting and setting a false example of what it means to be a follower of Christ to new believers and to their own children. To have a church made up of disciples of Christ, we as men and women must be disciples of Christ with a current testimony. 1 Timothy 3, 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Easy to go home after church and have roast pastor for lunch or supper when your life is in chaos. Toll and Jr. were managers. The result was spoiled ungodly kids and a nation just waiting to backslide. Judges 10, 6, and the children of Israel, Israel did evil again, again, in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. Wow. They went after the gods of the Canaanite, of Syria, Sidon, Moab, of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And, and what we've got to see is that they were doing all this while they were still going to the temple to worship God. Just like today. The majority chase the world, soak themselves in the world and pornography and fornication, and then go to church on Sunday, wave their flags, do their dancing. Their whole life is a mess. Their marriages are a mess. We've got to see this. I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm trying to get people to judge themselves because I want to judge myself. Way too many managers and not enough leaders. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Guess what? They're here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And if you go on in that verse, you'll see that these he's talking about the church, not the world. And boy, is this the case. To be a leader today, it will cost you dearly. It will cost me dearly. It costs Christ, it costs Paul, and it will cost us. And we will not be liked by the crowd in the church. 2 Timothy 3.12, yea, and all that will live godly in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. 
Well, if we're not suffering persecution, we must not be living godly. But to not be a godly leader and just a manager like Tola and J.R. will cost us the peace of God, the joy of the Lord, and our kids. The false god of crossless, vain religiosity will creep in and replace the cross-filled relationship. And who wants that dead religiosity? I don't, I don't want that. I'd rather be dead. Let's go on and see what happens. Judges 10, 7 through 9. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and unto the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they, they, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan and the land of Amorites, which is Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon uh, passed over Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and because we've served Balaam. Now, the, the land of the Gileads, I should mention this, was on the other side. They're the ones who didn't cross over. Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they didn't cross over. So they took them over, and then it spread all through Judah, Ephraim. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. Is your life shaking? Are there trials? Don't think God stopped loving you. Pain and suffering in our lives are not caused by God. Most of the time we cause them or they're caused by others or by the devil. However, God uses them to get rid of spiritual weakness and compromise. Some say that spiritual pain is weakness leaving our body. 2 Timothy 2.3 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. True character can only be forged through adversity. And most run and hide in drugs or porn or TV shows, whatever it may be, food, and then complain about the adversity. Brothers, sisters, we live in extreme times, and extreme times call for extreme measures. God is trying to break his people loose from idolatry. Israel was sore distressed, and that is what loving discipline for sin compromise does. It brings us into that state of being sore distressed and brings us to repentance. Who repents when everything's going good? Judges 10, 10 through 14. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken God and served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines and the Zidonians, also in the Amalekites and the, and the, and the Mennonites? Did when they oppressed you and you cried unto me and I delivered you out of their hand, yet you've forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go cry unto those gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you from your tribulation. Wow. I'm afraid God is saying this to a lot of church people today who are crying out to God and getting no answer. Yeah, I think if you listen hard enough, you'd say, well, go cry out to the idols that you've been serving. After serving God, false gods and self for 18 years, they see that their false gods and their idols have failed them like many of us today. To come to victory, we've got to have leaders that, that see that we've forsaken God and are are, are, and see that we've been serving self in the world. We, we must have no compromise fathers and mothers and church leaders and government leaders who will judge themselves and cause others to do the same no matter the cost. We must have no compromise Christians who will face their fear and speak out, come out, and lead others out of compromise. 
So, Israel's repentance comes in stages. First, they see their sin and admit their sin. But God's response is unfavorable. He reminds them of all that he's done for them. Then those chilling words will cry out to the gods that you've chosen. See if your fishing and your golf and your pickleball can save you. See if all the irresponsible rebellion and fear and drugs and education and hobby, girlfriend, next wife, porn, sex, bitterness, religiosity can save you. God, help us to cry out to him today and then be willing to listen to his words. Repent in, in godly sorrow and find victory. Israel was sorry for their sin, but for the wrong reasons. It was all about self. It was because they were suffering. People today are in the same. They cry out, but it's only because they want to be comfortable. There's two kinds of sorrow. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Because God is loving, he'll wait for the real. I got a telephone call yesterday from a backslider. Big time. Deep into meth and all kinds of other things. He called me to apologize because he was in treatment. He said he was sorry for the for the things that he had done and said. I said, well, I, I, I've already forgiven you for that. And the only thing I could say to you is bring forth fruit that proves you've repented. And he said to me, how could you have known that? I said, known what? That's in the Bible. He said, but that's what God is saying to me. Praise the Lord, the guy's come into godly sorrow. Most people who are in the church have, Got sorrow. They're sorry for their situation. Bill Clinton said he was sorry for what he did with Monica Lewinsky, but he continued to go on doing it with others. At leader, as leaders, we've got to help people come to, we've got to come to it ourselves and then help people come to real godly sorrow. And then get a testimony because they're judging themselves. The manager will only want an easy life. He's not going to set a standard of repentance. Then there comes the third stage of repentance. And the example of godly sorrow in Judges 10, 15, and 16. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto you. Wow. Deliver us only, we pray, this day. And they put away their strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And this, his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. <laughs> the third stage was godly sorrow. And with that uh, it comes these things. First, they confess their sin. Second, they stopped complaining about the chastening. Third, they put away their idols. Fourth, they served God. True repentance has got an energy to it and brings forth a change. 2 Corinthians 7, 11. Listen to these powerful words. See what, uh, what godly sorrow has produced in you. What earn, e earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation. What alarm. What longing. What concern. What readiness to see justice done. And at every point you've proven yourself to be innocent in this matter. True godly people got to do the same and lead others to do the same by example. We've got to confess our sin, admit that we've served self, stop complaining to God about the results of our sin. We've got to have earnestness, eagerness, alarm, longing, and a true desire to prove that we've repented. Verse 16, we see repentance de de defined. They turn from their sin and they change the way they think and, and they go toward God. They put away their strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. What's the biggest thing that we need to repent of? It's unbelief. It's the sins of omission that caused the sins of commission. If we truly believe, we'd have a prayer life. Prayerlessness is a sin. And we've got to stop making excuses and blaming others and whining about our situation that we've caused. 
And as we openly live an example of godly sorrow and true repentance, we can then with character hold up that standard to others, that standard that has been lowered in the church because of compromised managers, pastors and men and women alike. Colossians 3, 8 through 10. But now you also put off all these, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your life, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. True repentance requires a change of heart and a change of thinking, and the behavior then follows and character is built. You've got to put off and put on. Christian holiness can't be lived in a vacuum of I'm sorry. I'm sorry isn't repentance. It, godly sorrow leads to repentance, but it's not repentance. Repentance has been defined for us. It's actually to do the opposite of our sin. Judges 10, 17, 8, 18. Then the children of Israel, excuse me, then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped against Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and camped in Mitzvah, and the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will bring to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be the head over all the inhabitants. We're right back where we started. Israel's ready to fight, but there's no leader. Today, there are some who are willing, but they have no leader. Let's ask ourselves as we end this message today. Are we a leader or a manager? Are we serving self or serving God? Do we have godly sorrow and repentance? Are we facing our situation and becoming more than conquerors? Or are we being conquered? These are the last days. And God is looking for men and women who will judge themselves and become leaders. So now Israel's without a leader. They're ready to go, but they don't have a leader. And that's where we'll pick up next time as God brings a leader to them. My favorite guy in Scripture. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you will help every one of us to live what has been ministered here today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, until next time, God bless you.